Robert Stearns. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. I really believe that learning is one of the greatest joys in life. And one of the greatest ways to learn is simply to have meaningful conversations, both with those who come from a similar background as yours, as well as those whose background might be very different. So my hope is that as we connect and converse with leaders from all around the world, that we will learn and grow together. If you're new with us, hit the subscribe button and we'll deliver the new episodes to you right away. So wherever you are, on a run, in the car, at the kitchen table with some coffee, welcome to the conversation. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to an Eagle's Wings First. Welcome to this edition of Bishop and the Rabbi. And for the first time, we're we're doing a lot of firsts tonight. Uh, For the first time ever, we have a live studio audience. We are coming tonight from Blue Mountain Christian Retreat Center right here in the hills of Pennsylvania. Let's go to get a shot on everybody here. And uh, here's everybody. We are live coming from... Blue Mountain. There we go. Give a shout out, everybody. And so we are super excited about that. We've never done, we've never come live from Blue Mountain. We've never had a live studio audience. And the night of all nights, We are going live to Jerusalem in just a few minutes from right now. So what an incredible night it is. And we're on. We're good. All right. We're uh, we've got we're 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 learning technology left and right. I'm frozen on my screen, but they say that we're good on the live. So I'm going to keep pressing on. And man, I'm telling you what, shout out to Ashley and our production team. They do an incredible job. All right, so we have, uh, well, all right, that just went out on me again. That's always difficult. Enter studio. I'll try it again. Is that what I do? Hit the enter studio. All right. Camera's blocked. Join without. I'm getting to be a pro. I'm getting to be a pro at this. There we go. I think I'm back in. Somebody talk to me from back there. All right. Need, Need hand signals from the peanut gallery in the back, please, so I know what's going on. Very good. Well, we've got tonight, who do we have? We have Boston, Massachusetts in the house. Uh, We have Baltimore, Maryland. We have Buffalo, New York. We have Bolingbrook, Illinois. We have Eden, New York. We have Kenmore, New York. We have Columbus, Indiana in the house. And so many others. Folks, sign in. Tell us who you are and where you are watching from. And please go ahead and hit the share button uh, as soon as you can. That will help us fill up the room. And that will uh, get the word out. There we have Ohio is in the room. And uh, many other folks signing in. I'm going to pay attention here because this keeps hitting me off. There we go. Okay. Uh, Texas is with us. Tennessee is with us in the house. Uh, And as you guys, Cherry Hill, New Jersey is here. Lots of Jersey folks. Anybody from Jersey? Make some noise, Jersey. There we go. Pastor PJ Anastasi from Fort Myers, Florida is with us. God bless you, Pastor PJ. Love you and love my Word of uh, Life family there in Fort Myers. Sign in, everybody. Let me know where you're watching from. Every week we get together and we study the Word of God. We are so blessed and so honored to welcome to this program every week esteemed rabbis. Uh, Rabbis who have spent their life going deep into the Word of God. And we study together the Torah, these first five books of the Bible. I don't know about you. I don't know much about building. Uh, I'm not a construction worker. I don't know a lot about construction, but I know this. I know that to have a strong building, you've got to have a strong foundation. I know that a foundation is key um, to all that happens in building. And so the Torah is the foundation of our Uh, the revelation of God to us. It is the first five books of the Bible 
that God released uh, through at Sinai and through all of these incredible stories. So we uh, are so blessed every week to come together and study the Word of God together. Now, we're going to make an effort right now uh, to go live to Jerusalem in just a second. Uh, let me set this up for us. Uh, many of you know over the years the close friendship and partnership between Eagles Wings and Rabbi Shlomo Riskin and the community in Efrat. Uh, I've brought hundreds, maybe thousands of you, to Efrat with me over the years, uh, just outside, in fact, Pennsylvanians, right down the road is what? Ephrata. Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Well, guess where Rabbi Brander, they live in Eph the real one, the first one, Ephrat, from where Ephrata gets its name. And Ephrat is just a few kilometers from Bethlehem. You can see Bethlehem from Ephrat. And Rabbi Riskin uh, is, uh, is getting up there. And so he has an age. Uh, so he's giving his time to writing and praying and, and uh, just fathering the next generation. And he has welcomed to the, le the leadership of Or Torah Stone, an amazing rabbi that we are so blessed and honored to have with us tonight. Uh, rabbi uh, Kenneth Brander, let me just, it would take forever to go through all of this, but uh, after he served for 14 years as the senior rabbi of the Boca Raton Synagogue. Don't you love it that these Jewish leaders, I mean, who, are, you know, man, send me to Boca, right? Like, I mean, I'll be happy in Boca. But he said, no, I'm going to leave the life of comfort in Boca, and I'm going to go to the land of my inheritance. I'm going to go to the land of Israel. Uh, he has had so many accolades, so many leadership titles over the years, uh, and we are so honored to welcome the head of Orator Stone and its 30 separate related entities uh, to Bishop and the Rabbi. Can we give a huge Eagles Wings welcome to Rabbi Dr. Kenneth Brander. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you can hear the shouting and clapping. I can. I can hear it. Wonderful. Can hear it. Jerusalem can hear it. Well, listen, everybody. Rabbi has gotten up in the middle of the night. It is four in the morning uh, there in Jerusalem just to teach us, teach us, just to share the word of God with us. We're so honored. We are so blessed. So, Rabbi, let me just give you the opening word, the opening statement before we go to the Parsha. Uh, just, just share with us a little about your journey. How did you discern uh, this calling uh, to be a rabbi? What was that spiritual journey like for you? And then a follow-up question, what was that spiritual journey like, you know, connecting then with Israel, leaving Boko Raton and uh, assuming this role? Give us a little bit of your personal journey. Right, thank you. Um, I uh, I was in high school, and in high school, I I was in a religious high school, and I didn't really, I wasn't really inspired at all. And I decided that prior to starting university, I was accepted actually to a university program, a six-year program where I would get my bachelor's as well as a medical degree. And I decided that I would spend a year of study in Israel. And I studied in an interesting institution, one that uh, young men study in, but also served in the IDF. I, as a, an American, didn't serve in the IDF, but I watched hundreds of young people study for a year and a half, and then serve in the IDF in the most prestigious of units, and then come back and serve. And I saw for the first time at least in my personal development, a group of people who served God through being active, but also served God spiritually through study and were advanced in both. They were commandos, paratroopers, you know, served in the most elite units, but also were inspired by the word of God and the study of the text, both the written and the oral tradition. It changed my life. I, I didn't go 
to that joint six-year program. I went to Yeshiva University, got a bachelor's in math and science, and uh, studied. And then, you know, there's no coincidences in life, but I was studying. My teacher, my professor, my Talmud teacher was Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, one of the great inspirations. And the family actually asked me to uh, live in his apartment. He had a one-bedroom apartment at Yeshiva University. And to live, he was getting older in years, and they wanted uh, uh, one, of the, one of the students to, to, to live there. So that, and I would study with him two days a week privately with some now, of his younger students. I'll interrupt you there for just a moment because I want to give some context to our, our wonderful folks for what you're saying. Uh, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchek, who he's referring to, uh, many people credit uh, as, as kind of the father of what is known as the modern Orthodox movement. And within Judaism, you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the ultra-Orthodox movement, the Haredi movement, the Lubavitcher movement, etc. Uh, but then there was this Rabbi Soloveitchek who said, how do we hold on to our values how do we hold on to the things that are essential, but also um, live and move in the modern world uh, so that we are not just, um, you know, uh, marginalized and we don't insulate ourselves from society, but we become, you know, to use Jesus phrase, we become light. We are, we are integrated. And so this was a sea change of thinking in, in the Orthodox movement, and Rabbi Soloveitchik led this. Uh, he wrote many, many books, but my favorite is a book called The Lonely Man of Faith, uh, and a powerful work of his. And uh, his nephew, uh, Mayor Soloveitchik, uh, is a dear friend of mine and continues as a rabbi in Manhattan. So when Rabbi Brander says, uh, I was invited by the Soloveitchik family, you know, to, 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 to live and to care and to be involved in his life in his latter years. I mean, that would be like, you know, can you, can you go help out Oral Roberts? You know what I mean? Can you, I mean, this kind of a thing. And so, so Rabbi, this was this favor of God um, on you at this young age. God was elevating you like he elevated David at a young age, like he elevated Joseph at a young age. He was, you know, Proverbs says a man's gift makes room for him and brings him in front of powerful people. Your gifting began to make room for you. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, what happened was that uh, I was toying with the idea of going for rabbinical ordination. I had the application on the dining room table in this one bedroom apartment that we shared. And the next day I came back from my university studies or the, that night and I saw connected to the application which had, had yet to be filled out. I saw that he had written me a handwritten recommendation. Um, and that really sealed it for me. Uh, and when I submitted my uh, application, the dean of the rabbinical school said, you realize that your recommendation is probably worth more than the degree you're going to get in three years or four years from now. Um, and uh, this probably was true. And uh, then I started uh, being a rabbi in uh, Boca Raton, uh, the Boca Raton community. The synagogue and community flourished um, exponentially from 60 to 600 families, thank God, in 14 years. Um, and we built all the different uh, institutions that are required for a Jewish community. And um, I became vice president of Yeshiva University. And, and at, Rabbi Riskin had come to me and said, listen, you know, for 10 years I've been looking for someone to take over his wonderful work. And um, I don't think anyone can take over for Rabbi Riskin, but you can try to, uh, I try not to mess it up and I try to build on what he's created. Um, and my wife and I, after some of our children already had moved to Israel, um, and uh, more importantly, grandchildren living in Israel, uh, we decided that we would uh, make the next stage in our life. We always wanted to live in Israel. Israel is the home of the Jewish people. Uh, it's the light in which we can share with the rest of the world uh, if we can create a harmony in the land of Israel. So we decided... Uh, and uh, making that jump, we came here a little bit more than two and a half years ago. 
And it's been a wondrous journey and a wonderful experience. And to engage with Rabbi Riskin has been a privilege of a lifetime. Well, and, and let me just say, um, and then we have to get to the Parsha because there's just so much. But, and well, you know, please, God, hopefully we can we can do this again sometime, but we'll find a way to not do it in the middle of the night for you. But it's uh, fine. Well, you're very kind. Uh, but let me just, I'm, I'm actually leaving here on Sunday to go on a seven-day writing retreat because I'm finishing my next book. Uh, I'll announce that tonight for the first time publicly. My next book will be coming out soon, and it is a book on the life of Nehemiah. And when I think of Rabbi Riskin, uh, folks, Rabbi Riskin was the rabbi of the Lincoln Square Synagogue in the middle of Manhattan at the height of his career enjoying incredible prestige, incredible security, I would imagine a good income. And he tells the story that he went to hear, uh, I can't remember which prime minister, it might have been Begin or Shamir, no, Shamir perhaps. Um, and and the, the prime minister said, what are you doing in Manhattan? Don't you know that Israel needs you? And the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, spoke to Rabbi, and Rabbi and 11 families left Manhattan and said, we're going to go and rebuild Jerusalem. They went to Ephrat, and Rabbi's first night they got there. Now, they went to Ephrat, and there was no Ephrat, because it had not yet been rebuilt. Folks, this is the prophecy of the book of Amos coming to pass in front of our eyes. They will rebuild the ruined cities. Ephrat was a ruined, desolate uh, city, and they moved there the first night. They were in tents and temporary shelters, and they handed Rabbi Riskin an Uzi, and they said, Rabbi, you're on guard duty tonight. This was his introduction. This was the Nehemiah moment, folks. This is what it is to live for your beliefs, uh, to act out the book of James that says, uh, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. And this is the amazing example that the Jewish people set for us. So, uh, Rabbi, we can go on and on, but bring us tonight to our Parsha. Everybody, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to pick it up in verse 12. Verse 12 is the beginning of Parsha Akev. And... Um, uh, Rabbi is going to bring us into this wonderful Parsha that deals with a lot of things, talks a lot about the land of Israel, talks about the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments and the tablets. Uh, it talks about the Shema, many different themes, and we can't get to all of them, but Rabbi, bring us through two or three of your favorite themes from this Parsha, sir. Thank you so very much. So first, I think before we get to the Parsha, we should get to the book. Bishop, you mentioned about the foundation and the five books of Moses that is really the infrastructure of the foundation. But there's a difference between the first four books and the fifth book of the Bible. The first four books are written in the third person. The fifth book is written in the first person. The fifth book has a name. It's called Mishnah Torah. And the word Mishnah Torah means, in English, a second Torah meaning that the, the book of Deuteronomy is really the word of Moses to the people. It's a second form of God speak, where essentially what happens is that the word of God is written by Moses in the first person, highlighting the fact that in any relationship, whether it's a marriage or the relationship between God and his chosen people, or God and any human being, there has to be a partnership. There has to be a dialogue. There has to be a communication. The first four books represent the word of God to the Jewish people. But the fifth book is written in a totally different way. It's a second Torah paradigm, a second form of God speak, and where the Jewish people are essentially writing and speaking to God Obviously, God edited, God approved, uh, God uh, choreographed. But the bottom line is the second book represents a totally different style 
of how the text is written. I think that's a critical uh, message for all of us that when we want to have a relationship, even with God, it's it has to work both ways. It has to be something that we find the spirit of God, that Ruach HaKodesh, that, that energy from God, but we have to contribute to the energy also. And I think that enhances, if it's possible, to enhance God, uh, which is always a existential dilemma in any thought uh, idea. But we can enhance the presence of God in this world when we realize that we're essentially an extension of God. And Sefer Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, this Mishnah Torah, this book of words represents a, a, a engagement by the Jewish people into the land and into the engagement with God. If I could just amplify that remark just uh, with one more statement, you mentioned Rabbi Soloveitchik and the lonely man of faith, Adam one and Adam two, we won't get into that. But the bottom line is that in the Garden of Eden, this pristine paradise, when Adam and Eve are passive in their relationship with God, when the only thing they have to do is decide which vegetation, which fruit they can eat and which fruit they can't eat, that relationship doesn't work. Basically, Adam and Eve get thrown out of the Garden of Eden and the Spirit of God disappears, so to say. It's only when Adam and Eve are re-engaged and they have to be active participants in the process that relationship works because humankind needs to engage. And if I can now get to the parsha for a second, the Torah portion, the Torah portion even mentions that there is a first set of commandments, first set of tablets that are given on Mount Sinai and a second set of tablets. The difference between the first and the second is in the presentation. In the first set of tablets, the Jewish people are passive. Even Moses is passive. God writes the tablets, hands them to Moses. That doesn't work out so well. Those tablets are shattered. But the second set of tablets... The tablets, that first set of tablets, is the tablets that are shattered when Moses comes down and encounters the idolatry of the golden calf. Correct. The, because when people are passive, they're not engaged, idolatry of all different sorts wow. uh, can happen. And then what happens is... That, that was profound. That, that's that, true in marriages also. It's true in every relationship. When there isn't engagement. And then in the second set of tablets, God tells Moses, you need to write them. I'll wait for you on the mountain, but you need to write them. And when Moses comes down from the mountain the second time, we're told that there is a Quran or there is a um, there is light emanating from Moses's face because Moses is not just the FedEx person who brings the tablets from one place to another place. Now Moses represents the message; he's written it, and therefore he, he there's a change even in his physical being. And the whole relationship between God and the Jewish people, God and society changes when we are engaged. I think that's the first message of this week's parasha, of this week's Torah portion. And I think it's the message of the book of De Deuteronomy, the second paradigm of God speak in which human initiative plays a certain role in the text. That's, well, the first thing. that's worth the price of the ticket right there. We could go home right now, but we, we won't, but we could. Folks, if you've just tuned in, tonight is a historic night. We are coming live on Bishop and the Rabbi from Blue Mountain Christian Retreat Center. Make some noise, church. There we go. And and uh, we're so blessed to be live at Blue Mountain this week. We, we've missed being able to gather, but here we are. And we're going live to Jerusalem, joined by uh, our amazing rabbi, uh, Rabbi Dr. Kenneth Brander, who is the new head of Or Torah Stone, assuming that mantle of leadership from Rabbi Shlomo Risk. And do us a favor, folks. You've got one job tonight. Hit the share button. Would you do that, everybody? Hit the share button. Beloved, we are moving in the calling of Jerusalem-based Christianity. Folks, guess what? Newsflash, PR release. Jesus is Jewish. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul is Jewish. We, we have all kinds of Gentiles trying to understand this book, 
from a Roman Greco perspective, and we don't understand the history, we don't understand the shades of meaning, we don't understand the context, and these wonderful, wonderful rabbis are coming, uh, not because we're giving them some big honorarium, not because we're, uh, no, because they believe they are called to be an or hagoyim, a light to the Gentiles. And that's what happens as they break open this word of life to us. Now, do we agree on everything theologically? No, we do not. Um, but uh, as I've often said, three or four times a week, I don't agree with myself theologically, right? I mean, so we are wrestling with the word of god we are journeying in the word of god we are learning iron is sharpening iron uh but uh i do know this i know that these rabbis know the word of god and the last time i checked in the beginning was the word the word was with god the word was god well they know the word of god and so we want to learn from them and Rabbi, you know, you just closed this in that last section, and you're going to go now to the second section, but you closed with something so profound about this partnership with God and not being in the place of passivity. And really, I, I think the point is this, folks. Um, anybody can prophesy. Uh, it's another thing to allow your life to become the prophecy. Don't pray prayers that you're not willing to, to become the answer to. So when Rabbi Riskin and Rabbi Brander over the years prayed next year in Jerusalem, uh, the Holy Spirit eventually one year tapped them on the shoulder and said, guess what? For real now, we're going. We have to view ourselves as those who are partnering with Hashem, partnering with God in history to see His sacred purposes unfolded. Rabbi, take us into the next section of this incredible Parsha. So in light of the fact that we are speaking from Jerusalem, uh, a piece of the Parsha that speaks to me is found in chapter 8, verse 7. It's the introduction of God, of us, God bringing us into the land of Israel. And the verses here really speak in such poetic tones about the land, but also speaks about the similar idea that you and I were discussing. It starts out with saying... And I hope you don't mind if I introduce it both in Hebrew and in English. Please. Because the Lord your God will bring you to the land. First of all, it's important to realize that there are two names of God used here. The God of intimacy, yud heh vav -Hey, and the God of power. Speaking about an intimate relationship that God has with us and also the God of power. He brings us to the land, and that's a key word here, the land, Eretz. A right. land that is that flows with streams, that emanates from the hills and from the valleys. And it's a very passive role for us in the introduction. God is going to bring us to this land, this beautiful land. And then the next verse, verse 8, again, is, is, intro, is introduced with the word land. Eretz, chitas, ora, gefente, navarimon. A land that has the various species of grains, of uh, of uh, of the vines, of pomegranates, of figs, and here again, the the role of the individual is to plant and to reap. That's some work, not a lot of work. It is serious work, but not a lot of work. And then again, the word land is mentioned. Every time the word land is mentioned, it steps up human involvement. Eretz, the land, zeit shemen udavash of olive oil and of honey here you're not just taking the olive but the human initiative requires that you take the olive and you have to crush it and make it into oil a little bit more work and the devash is the honey is date honey again a little bit more work so you see this movement in the text from the individual from the human being being passive to the human being have to play an active role and then it goes on the next verse nine, a land in which you won't be wanting anything and you'll be able to eat bread. Bread is a much more active process to bring from the wheat to the final product uh, on the table is a real, it, it, there's multiple steps. It's a, it's a much more challenging, arduous task than picking the grapes 
or even making the al uh, or making the oil. There's a movement here of the human initiative. Lo texar koba, and therefore you won't be wanting because it's a responsibility for there to be this partnership that we're talking about, not just to have the prayer, but to answer the call. And then it goes on and it says, Eretz, again, the key word land, asher avaneha barzel that there are minerals in the land. There is copper and there is, um, there, there is all different types of minerals, including, as we know now, gas and oil. There are beautiful minerals. But again, human initiative here is much more required. And then it ends with, and that you should bless God. Because often what happens is that when the human initiative plays such a pri uh, prominent role, you forget about God. And therefore, the grace after meals for, for consuming bread is elongated because, you know, you might think, hey, I made the bread. I, you know, I, I, I harvested the wheat. I went through all the processes. Forget about God. No, it's when the human initiative is so great that you also have to remember that the senior partner in the process is God. So you see this movement in the text. It's beautiful poetry but also the word Eret punctuates every stage of elevation of the human initiative, but still reminds us it's bracketed with the recognition of God in the process and the partnership that we have to see happening in creating harmony, Bishop, like we're having now, the ability for us to learn from each other and the ability to create a land of Israel, which is a light unto the nations, which has certain norms and mores and values that we can celebrate. That's why God wants us to be as an or like I am a light unto the nations in our land, but we have to be able to light the light that can create that relationship and remember the centrality of God in that process. So powerful, Rabbi, just profound. And, and uh, so many folks are tuning in from all over the country. I see that Bishop Matthew Brown is with us tonight. Bishop Brown from Atlanta, one of the great, great leaders in the body of Christ today. Welcome, Bishop Brown. Looking forward to being with you at your Episcopal uh, elevation in October. Folks, if you're just joining in, please help us and hit the share button. Also, would you consider tonight doing what Rabbi is saying, which is getting involved, moving from the place of the passive to the active, would you make a gift tonight to Abraham's Bread? We have two feeding centers that we support in Israel, one in Jerusalem and one on the Sea of Galilee. And our partners, do, were any of the partners here tonight on the partners call about, what, two, three weeks ago? Wave your hand if you're on the part. Yes. And we presented a $25,000 check uh, to our feeding centers just about three weeks ago to sustain uh, the people in the land in the midst of this rough time. Tourism is the main um, component to Israel's economy. And so Israel has suffered amazingly. You can help us tonight. Go to eagleswings.org forward slash donate. If you've never made a gift to this ministry, would you consider tonight? Rabbi's gotten up at four in the morning. All you need to do is make a gift and, uh, and make a difference tonight. But Rabbi, what strikes me remarkably about what you're sharing is this. Who is Hashem speaking to? Who is God speaking to? He's speaking to people who've just spent 400 years in slavery or 210, depending on which interpretation, but generations in slavery. And all of a sudden, God is saying, you are no longer slaves. You are partners with God. You are partners with me. God is transforming the identity of these people who have been so beleaguered, who have been so beaten down, who have been so abused, who have been so taken advantage of. And when they enter into conversation with the divine, their spirits are elevated and they remember that they are created in the image of God in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. And beloved, can I tell you this today? Out in society, out in the world, there's a lot of victim complex going on. There's a lot of people view. 
this one's a victim and this one's a victim and let's get all the victims together and throw a victim party. And I want to tell you, that is a black hole that never leads to anywhere. If you're going to live a life of bitterness and unforgiveness and negativity and blaming, folks, you're never going to advance. I want to tell you, yes, Horrible things happen, and yes, we need to work for justice, but we also have to say, thank God, this, my life's destiny is not written on this side of eternity. There's a good God in heaven who has a good plan for my life, and he is the one who is writing my future, and I get to partner with him. Hallelujah. Rabbi, you are modern Orthodox, and we are Pentecostal, just to make that clear. We're Pentecostal around here. So we like to shout occasionally, but we'll we'll teach you that, and you'll. No, you'll... it's beautiful. It's beautiful. We like to shout over here, also. Hopefully, not at each other, but in our engagement with God. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, but Bishop. Folks. If I could just, at you know your point about the transformation in the Jewish people, from one generation to the next, I think that's why Moses doesn't leave the Jewish people into the land of Israel. You know, people speak about the striking of the rock. I think that's a paradigm because in the, if you look at the, the uh, Hebrew text, God tells Moses, he tells Moses that the Jewish people have to speak to the rock, meaning that Moses, you know, the first time water came from a rock, you had to hit it because the Jewish people were slaves. They, weren't, they were nomads. They, didn't, they couldn't take the initiative. They couldn't, they, 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 as you said, they had the complex that they were slaves. But at a certain point, they have to take the initiative. And God wants the Jewish people to speak to the rock. And by speaking to the rock, water should emanate from the rock, not that Moses does it for them. And when Moses has to strike the rock, what God says to Moses is, listen, you know, we need a different paradigm of leadership. One in which it's not a top-down leadership, which was a Moses paradigm, but a Joshua paradigm in which there's more of an initiative by the people to actualize the word of God. And if you, again, this is not the time to do this, but if you follow their, their, their missions, you will see they have similar experiences. They both cross bodies of water. They both have different experiences. But right. how they do it, because the people are different, is different, different leaders for different times. Well, and the people had matured because this was right. in most part from the beginning when when some of the camp began to prophesy and they tried to shut it down. Moses said, I wish all God's people would prophesy. Uh, so there, you know, that was in Moses' heart, but it took a season for the people to obtain that level of maturity that they were able to then lead. And of course, it was right after that that the tribes then all entered their various territories and began to function, you know, tribally in their tor territories. Listen, folks, we are coming. Our, uh, unfortunately, our time is slipping away. Rabbi, we're going to come back to you to make one more point. But before you do, uh, I know that so many of our listeners, Rabbi teaches uh, every week online and has a, an email newsletter he sends out. And uh, you can get these wonderful, wonderful nuggets of Jewish wisdom. And uh, Rabbi, how do our folks follow you and connect with you? Because I know many will want to. That's very sweet of you. Yes, um, you can. They can send me if they send me an email. I I think we there's a website that they can go to if they go to the ots.org.il ots.org.il they can register. And we'll send it to them every single week. Um, and they can hear some of these ideas. OTS.org.il. Just go to the website and um, you'll be able to see how you can click and join our Parsha teachings, which uh, is an amazing opportunity for me to learn from the listeners who share with me ideas and hopefully for me to share little nuggets that people can benefit from. Beautiful. Just wonderful. Well, folks, we're having an incredible night coming live from Blue Mountain Christian Retreat Center. We have people signed in literally all across America and a few from around the world. And it's just so incredible. And help us by hitting the share button. It really makes a difference, folks. I've got to tell you, when you do the like and the share, 
the algorithm world gets happy and, and it helps us to spread the word. So become a social media partner with me. Uh, follow me along on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, as we continue to prepare the way of the Lord uh, by uh, reminding people uh, that we have been grafted into uh, a covenant. And the covenants of God come uh, based on a book, a land, and a people. The book is the Torah. The land is Israel, and the people are the Jews. These are the three pillars of our faith. And uh, this does not in any way diminish the presence of Jesus in our life. This augments Jesus in our life because we're finally meeting the real Jesus. Uh, some of us only know the American Jesus. Some of us only know the evangelical Jesus. And what's happening is that idolatry is being removed. And we are discovering Jesus is in his historic, cultural, Jewish context. Somebody say amen. Amen. Well, Rabbi, our time is almost gone, but I've got to give you the last word. Uh, uh, please give us just your final thought. Uh, we can go to one more uh, short drosh, uh, and then hopefully you'll consider joining us again sometime. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I really enjoyed it, and it's an amazing opportunity for us to be able to study together. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just actually just continue on our thought and maybe just add one more thing, and that is, first of all, the, the passages of perhaps the most important prayer service for the Jewish people, the Shema, is found in the book of Deuteronomy, at least the first two sections of the Shema. The first section was found earlier in the book, and the second section is found in this week's uh, Parsha, in this week's Torah portion. But I think it speaks to what we've been talking about, Bishop, and that is the responsibility for us to engage in a relationship with God. Shema Yisrael, hero Israel. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Lord is, is our God, the Lord is one. That is a pronouncement about the relationship with God. But the second statement, um, Baruch Shem Kavod Machutol Elam Va'ed, Blessed is the name of God forever, which is actually not found in the text. And that's why in, in Jewish tradition, it is not uttered in the same volume of a voice. But that's really saying that if you really believe that God is, is the is your Lord, the God is one, then you have to guarantee the eternality in the, and the immortality of that relationship with God. And all of the Shema, the first chapter, the second chapter, is about an awareness of God, a love of God, an engagement with God, and the recognition that the energy that you receive from God is really directly related to our engagement with God. I truly believe that there is this yin-yang, this engagement, and, and while obviously we can always find God in our lives, irrespective of how active we are, but the more active we become, irrespective of how we worship, but the more active we become, I think then we are able to see God with greater clarity. And that's the message of the Shema that is particularly found in this book of the Bible, because this book, the fifth book, speaks about the human engagement with God. Rabbi, I think of that scripture where God says, call unto me, and I will show you great exactly. things that you do not know. There is that there is that relationship. There is that responsiveness uh, between us and God. And uh, surely uh, we have seen that and seen that modeled and demonstrated not only by the Jewish people in their entirety, uh, but very specifically by you and Rabbi Riskin who have become Nehemiah's exiles returning to your home and rebuilding the ruined cities. And we're so, so grateful. We can't wait to uh, meet in person and Bizrat Hashem continue this partnership, this special partnership that I've had with Rabbi Riskin and Ortora Stone. And Rabbi, Rabbi, you know, in 2004, 
there was not the kind of awareness. And I mean, it, this was groundbreaking on both sides. A hundred percent. Bishop, you were very courageous for what you were doing. And so was Reverend Riskin. And I want to invite you when you come to Jerusalem, I want, I want us to be able to study Torah together, but I want to introduce you to the thousands of our students, literally 5,000 students and an additional 350 that right now are serving in the Israeli Defense Forces in uh, on the borders as well as an intelligence unit. I'd love us to be able to study with them and engage with them. I think that would be a redemptive experience for us. I know I'm always inspired when I study with my students and I think getting uh, for them to know you, especially our rabbinical students and our women who are playing, uh, studying for leadership roles, I think that would be transformational for all of us. So I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming you and I'm inviting you all to, uh, to come to Israel, at least for a visit. And I'd love to spend some time with you in person. Well, Rabbi, I, I think that was a yes. I, th I think you heard a <laughs> you heard a yes from us, sir. So uh, we uh, we bless you. We bless Efrat. We bless Yerush Jerusalem. Uh, our community uh, prays. We sing the Shema every day. That's how we begin our morning. Every single morning, we blow the shofar every single morning. We've been doing it for twenty four years, uh, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem every day. And now when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, sir, we will see your face, your heart. We will hear your voice that Hashem should be the Shomrei Achumot, the, uh, the one who, who watches over you and over your family. So thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. It's been a very, very special evening from Blue Mountain to the mountains of Jerusalem. Uh, Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. God bless you. And God bless the community. God bless everyone. Keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem.